England and six other soccer teams dropped plans to wear anti-discrimination armbands at the Qatar World Cup after FIFA threatened them with sanctions. FIFA notified seven European teams that players would be subject to sporting sanctions, including automat automatic yellow cards for wearing One Love armbands. The target of the anti-discrimination message was understood to be anti-homosexuality laws in Qatar. The Wall Street Journal reports. MSNBC's Ayman Maladeen commented on criticisms of Qatar hosting the World Cup and double standards of the U.S. Let's watch. While it's fair to question and criticize Qatar, I wonder if this debate is truly about migrant workers' rights and human rights, or is it that European countries who view themselves as the guardians of global soccer for their own selfish economic purposes can't stomach the idea that an Arab Middle Eastern country will host this venerable global gathering? I wonder if any of these American pundits grandstanding about human rights will call for the U.S. to be stripped of hosting the 2026 World Cup for the way elected leaders in this country and our judicial system in this country have rolled back reproductive rights or are trying to ban the word gay in public schools or even ban books. I think that's some transparently absurd whataboutism, but... Uh this sounds like a terrible idea to have hosted the World Cup in this country. I, but I, 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 I look. If you want to say you, there should not be political messages just in general on people's armbands because sports should try to be politically neutral, I guess that would be fine. Uh, this seems actually that this is clearly specifically targeted to appeasing this country's anti-homosexuality laws. But they should not have gotten themselves into this situation by having the World Cup there. Is what I would say. They also banned beer for people in the, for fans attending. Did you hear that? Is is alcohol ordinarily yes. allowed in the country? No. Okay, so that's consistent with the rules of the But country. they're allowing it in certain of like special box, like people who paid extra or something, or like hmm. the, the very elite people well, are going well, to have I, it. I it just seems I bad. I want to go back to this question of it being um, whataboutism. Um, I don't know that I agree. I'm trying to work through this. Because look, we talk all the time when we criticize the justifications for U.S. imperialism, something that we agree about, about how we cherry pick human rights abuses, genuine instances of humanitarian um, need as being cravenly lifted up by the U.S. as a justification for our involvement. We talked about the women and children being exploited as a reason to um, invade Afghanistan. There was uh, the Gulf War being justified on this idea of like babies being thrown out of ventilators. We know that this to be the case. And that's not, some of those are lies, but some of it are legitimate, some of it is legitimate bad things right. happening in other parts of the world. Right, it is true that fewer women learn how to read under Taliban control or whatever it is. And it does seem similarly like a kind of a cherry-picking cherry of wrongdoing. Again, genuine political stances mm -hmm. and, and, and kind of a political leadership that I would disagree with, obviously, on the merits, but in a way that might be calculated to justify American um, hegemony and American superiority that it is actually helping the well-being of the people of the, of the folks in this country. And when you look at how America moves through the world, you heard, you know, obviously Joe Biden saying he was going to make Saudi Arabia pariah and then justifying not, uh, justifying shielding MBS for an investigation over the death of Jamal Khashoggi. And when you see all these inconsistencies about how we, there was a recent interview this past week with Jon Stewart, Condoleezza Rice, and Hillary Clinton, where they are still talking about weapons of mass destruction and how America is so different than the rest of the world and we have to intervene as America's policemen. It's what were they saying about weapons of mass destruction? That it, it was their, it was, they were mistaken and it, oh. we should all consider it to be a mulligan, you know, that, oh, yeah, that, yeah. that, that kind of a line. Our bad. You know, when, when you yeah. see rhetoric like that, you know, I don't think that's entirely dissimilar for, from some people in the West who are taking this opportunity, having agreed to participate in this uh, event to grandstand their own um, moral superiority when it's, I'm not sure that America can claim that ethical superiority when you look at how it's been behaving around the world. Mm, no, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't think, while I am a massive critic of a lot of the foreign policy decisions um, the U.S. makes, as are you, I, I mean, I think morally it is fine to grandstand over a nation like Qatar. I, now, I don't think it's necessarily important to 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 you know signal or virtual signal on some kind of social issue that they have a difference 
with us on, not, which is not to say that I mean, their, their views are, I think, are wrong. But I, I understand why people get upset at like, all, like within, within the U.S. context, right? All businesses say, we're not going to do business in Georgia or, or, or Indiana or wherever because of some religious freedom law. But then they don't, then they, oh, but, but if Qatar doesn't want you to wear armbands, rainbow armbands, okay, yeah, we're, we're not going to stand up to them. It's only ever standing up to, you know, bigoted, conservative Christian Republicans here, never standing up to a, a, a much worse version of well, religious yeah, I, extremism. Well, yeah, I think the, on the individual basis, I mean, there was a, people were talking about a particular journalist who is gay and who, you know, was wanting to wear the armband, had at one point, was pressured into not wearing it. You know, on an individual basis, I completely understand why people want to take their stands, and I have no feelings about their, their willingness and ability to do so. I do think that there's a media aspect of this, though, that is invested in the idea of kind of heroic Westerners standing up to um, the government of Qatar, the people of Qatar, in a way that doesn't seem, that, that it seems itself cherry-picked. So, for example, one could not go. Yeah. One could choose not to go. One could choose not to participate. Teams could choose to boycott. None of that is happening. Or, I mean, I guess some of that is happening, but people instead are choosing to go and then grandstand. So to me, it feels akin to like, one could argue that it's akin to visiting the Vatican and not wanting to follow the rules about covering your arms and legs while you're there. You know, it's perfectly fine to disagree with the Catholic Church, to criticize the Catholic Church, and to not also want to go and look at the Sistine Chapel. But if you want the benefit of going and seeing some artistic masterpiece or looking at it from a historical perspective, to go there and then loudly complain about the fact that it's hot and you don't want to wear a shawl so the seems to NFL be— NFL have a, or the NHL or the or a baseball, basketball, et cetera, have rules against players kneeling during the anthem? Isn't this kind of like that? Well, I think that if people, if they have those rules, then players have the right to object and to boycott and to, and to end the league. Mm -hmm. But that's, the, the question here is whether or not people are trying to have it both ways. Going and participating in this event, playing in a country that did not just invent these rules overnight, that they know has a, a kind of a humanitarian standards that are not the same as what you would expect in that the world. And at the same time, I think- not, not the same, but bad. Well, from my, my, my perspective, they are. I also think that, I'm sorry, it's not both with two million people in jail and the largest incarcerated population in the world, despite only having a much smaller fraction of the world's population, I think that it is extremely narrow mind and like short-sighted to sit here and judge other people's countries and not have that same expectation uh, the same judgment as the news commentator there said about what, what is America going to say that we don't deserve to hold an upcoming Olympic Games or whatever a, a kind of national event, global event, because of our own bad actions. Not to mention, it's not just about what happens in America. It's about what America is doing all across the world. So we can sit here and say, technically, we have rights to the United States of America, but what does it mean if we're toppling regimes, uh, acting in ways that are creating uh, slave, uh, you know, slave, slave prisons in Libya and destroying the civil rights of people all around the world to sit back, cross our arms, and say, oh, we're innocent because technically we have, you know, a Chelsea in Manhattan, you know? But, but we let little girls learn how to read and we don't jail homosexuals. So there are some improvements we have over these countries that could be hoped Which in means what in the context of this conversation? Well, I mean, that's what we're, we're getting into a moral relativism here. No, we're, no, we're not. And I, I had this conversation actually recently on my podcast with Coleman Hughes, and we were kind of have this philosophical conversation about what it means that it's such a common rhetorical device, I'm sorry, that conservatives use that say, well, this is better than that. It is better today than it was 60 years ago for black people. Like what that, what those kind of arguments do is often derail more substantive conversations about how things could be improved and what is still wrong to Today. So there's no problem with admitting that there's been improvement for, let's say, black Americans in the States. There's no problem in admitting that there are many, many respects in which the civil rights and li living standards of people in the United States, including for women in the United States, is better than the people of Qatar. That does not absolve the United States of responsibility and accountability for our actions, many of which are invisible because we have a media class that doesn't cover what goes on in the rest of the world. And th those of us like ourselves who are very aware of the negative effects of American imperialism, I think, should be cautious about why the media is choosing to draw contrast between Qatar and the United States at the same time that we're happy to avail ourselves of the resources and the events that are happening in Qatar, and at the same time that there is little to no criticism of the way that America enables um, despotic regimes all over the, the, the world as long but as they support us economically. I don't think we have to make excuses for Qatar because 
America just had a ruling on abortion that a lot of people. Is it making with. excuses for Qatar? Did well, I make excuses what, for Qatar? No, I think that that, that media clip. I think he did. Yeah. He made excuses for yeah, Qatar. It was pivoted. What about it? Well, you know, maybe that's bad, but. Oh, I, I didn't hear it that way. And I do think that there, I, you know, I have to go back and re-listen, but I think that there is a legitimate criticism, a legitimate scrutiny that should be given to why it is that the U.S. suddenly has an appetite to cover this um, when ordinarily it doesn't. And it is, is what very— What do you mean it doesn't have—the the ability to—the the apparent right to declare political uh, messages during sports games, like, that's a huge topic we've been discussing here. It ordinarily ignores the um, the kind of inequities that we see all over the world, including when it is politically convenient to do so. So, for example, in Israel, for example, in Saudi Arabia, and for example, our allies. So, one of the things that Hillary Clinton said in this interview, or maybe it was Condoleezza Rice, I can't remember which now, um, was that you know. Uh, uh, democracies don't invade other countries. Trying to make a distinction between, you know, what, when America intervenes and when it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I saw, I think true. it was Kyle Kalinske who pointed out that America financially supports and is allies with something like 70 odd uh, d d despotic regimes all across the world. And so it really isn't about those. The, when, whenever there's these articulations of principle, over and over again, we see that it's not actually about principle. The principles are real and they exist in the abstract, they exist mm -hmm. outside of the world of politics. But when these politics Politicians, when these warmongers, when when the state and all, when the media class, which is very much tethered with the state, makes these kind of criticisms, it's often not because of the general principle. It's because they're advancing some kind of political um, practice, and that's not the individuals on the ground, not LGBT people who are individually um, concerned with this. But I do think it's worth bringing some scrutiny to why certain people are making these criticisms at this time. That's all. I think it's a perfectly fine thing to analyze. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, tomorrow on Rising, we'll continue to get you updates on all the latest stories. There's some specificity for you. <laughs> Be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you never miss any content. And for those of you who like to listen while on the go, we are now available anywhere you listen to podcasts, and we're available on Roku and other streaming services. See you later. All right. Bye-bye.